right. Well, I want to welcome each and every one of you. If you're brand new with us this morning, my name is John Petrie. I co-lead pastor this church with my wife, Lindsay, who I got to tell you, it's like Christmas. It's like Christmas this week all over again because my beautiful bride came home and she's back and... and um, there's Patty. There she is. So, so you know who she is. That's her right there. I was bragging on you a minute ago. So, um, But uh, I am so excited that my wife's home, and, and um, I might just lock her up so that she can't leave anymore. But um, like I told you last week, she's going to be uh, going and, and visiting churches and pouring into women's ministries, and she has to go to Springfield. So just continue to pray for her and encourage her and, and women. Uh, and guys, uh, the women's ministry and, and the Arizona Women's Ministry Network is uh, having their women's conference coming up in February. I expect all you reclaimed ladies to be there. Guys, I am going to shame you if you don't get them a ticket. Um, if finances are a challenge, you come see me. We will make sure your women are going um, because it is life-changing. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, today we are in week two of our new sermon series uh, called Detoxify. And in this series, we're looking at all the things in our lives that can pollute us, that can cause harm to our bodies, our spirits, and our souls. You see, because so many times we are absolutely, we're unaware of the toxins that we're allowing into our lives and, and we let them build up in our systems until they become major trauma in all different kinds of areas. Last week, we looked at one of the areas of our lives, our bodies, and we identified some of the bigger things that have a tendency to tox out our physical nature, things like what we eat and what we consume, or addictions that we may struggle with, or a big one that, that God talks about is sexual immorality. And you see, the physical side of us is important. Not just because we want to look good and we want to feel good, and not just because we want to like live long and prosper, right? What is that, the Vulcan sign or whatever? Look, I can do it with my broken hand even. Like it's kind of like a hook hand, but um, you know, I can't make a complete fist. So if I ever had to like jump like Tom Cruise on Mission Impossible, I got a hook, but I can't like make a fist yet. So be praying for my hand as well. But, but we don't just do it so that we can live long and prosper. Um, we do it because here's the thing is our, our physical side is important. Because as we learned from Scripture last week, that each and every one of us, our bodies are actually temples of the Holy Spirit. And it's not about God being housed in this place right here. It's about God being housed and the Holy Spirit being housed in this place right here. Amen? So, we should want to do everything that we can to care for our bodies and to take care of the temples that God has given us. You know, it's kind of funny, um, last week uh, we finished up the sermon and I was out in the lobby and I was talking to a gentleman and I didn't share the analogy with you guys last week just because of time, but um, I was talking to him about that whole temple and bodies and everything else and I, I was sharing with him, it's kind of like a, a, a racehorse. If somebody had given you a Kentucky Derby winning thoroughbred racehorse and, and if they gave that to you as a gift, I ask you, how would you treat it? you would probably feed it the best food that it could possibly have, right? Definitely GMO-free. And, and you would probably make sure it got all the right amount of sleep every single day, right? And you would make sure it got the right kind of exercise. And you would take it to the vet regularly to have checkups to make sure it was in peak health. You would do everything you could to make sure that it was at its peak or at the top of its game, right? Right? But you see, God has given us so much, something so much more valuable than that. He's given us our bodies. He's given us a temple that he houses the Holy Spirit within. And instead of treating it like we would treat that thoroughbred racehorse, what do we do? We, we let our bodies stay up late so we don't get enough sleep. We feed it garbage all the time, right? We feed it energy drinks in my case scenario. We, we make sure that, you know, I mean, I, some of us, I don't even remember the last time I went to the doctor, right? We, we do all these things where we don't take care of our temple and it's so much more valuable than that racehorse, but yet we would treat it totally different. You follow where I'm going with that? And I love how God works because I'm sharing this analogy with this guy and literally he stops and he looks behind me and this is what he sees. <laughs> Now, you can't write this stuff. I, and I did not, I did not pay them or prop them to do that. But one of our interns, Dakota, who sings on the worship team with, with Cal, they come out of the auditorium doors wearing a horse head. And he looks up and he's like, whoa. You know, and I'm like, 
I was like, this is pretty cool, right? I'm like, what a confirmation from God. And that's a whole other sermon for another day. But God does that all the time, doesn't he? When we are in tune with his spirit, which we're going to talk about today, there are signs everywhere. Well, before we get into our topic specifically for today, I want to look at our anchor passage again. We, we talked about it last week, and I, I want to read it to you again. We find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18, and then chapter 7, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles handy or you have your smart device, if you'll pull it out and go to that, then we're going to read it together. All right, here we go. Once I get to it myself. Which, remember when I couldn't read last week? So I decided to do something really, really dumb. I got brand new bifocal contacts. Yeah, I'm in bifocals now. Thank you very much. And um, I decided to try them for the first time on Sunday. And all of a sudden, I looked down. I was like, oh, man, I couldn't get it close, far away, no nothing. I'm trying to read off of here. So um, hopefully they work better today. Here we go. So... Chapter 6, verse 14 through 18 and 7, 1. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For as we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. You see, it's right there, as we talked about last week in verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1, we find the basis of our series right there. Paul tells us that we are to detoxify ourselves in body and spirit. And what he's basically saying is, is that we need to clean ourselves from the inside and the outside so that we may experience the fullness of God's promise, which right there in verses 16 and 17, it says, is a complete intimacy with him. Now, I want to add something this week that we didn't talk about last week. I want to dig a little deeper into that. And we find it at the very last portion of the verse. It says that, that he is bringing holiness, which is the detoxifying part, right? That's, that's the detox or the clean cleansing part. He's bringing that to completion. It says, and here's these last three words, and they are critical, in the fear of God. Church family, we have to understand, and I'm telling you this right now, we will fail in detoxifying ourselves in body and spirit and soul if we are not doing it out of the fear of the Lord. But here's the deal with that. The word fear in this context is not insinuating a scared type of fear, a fear that should frighten us to detoxify ourselves. That's not it at all. That's not that we, it's not that we should be afraid of God uh, in that kind of sense or because we're afraid of his punishment. I mean, the reality is, is that it's obvious that's not the case or none of us would ever sin, right? Because the punishment for sin is death. The Bible's clear about that as well. And who really wants that, Right? I mean, it's pretty severe punishment. I, I don't know. I Call me crazy, but I think that's pretty severe. But the fear right here that he's talking about is more of a feeling of reverence, of awe, of, of anxiousness, uh, that, that dreading, dreading what we will miss out on by not experiencing that intimate closeness with our creator that he offers to each and every one of us, not tomorrow, not the next day, but right now. And he says he will dwell with, with us and he will walk with us. I mean, seriously, could you imagine what that would feel like every single day? Could you imagine being like Adam and walking with God each and every day with that type of intimacy and closeness? Well, you know what? You don't have to wonder. God says, I'll do that right now. I'll do that right now. And that feeling should overwhelm us and it should excite us and it should motivate us beyond all personal desires to strive for that holiness, to detoxify our lives and to draw near to him. And remember, remember the reason why, and I explained it last week, that we spell the word detoxify with an I and not a Y is not because I don't know how to spell, okay? kind of did it on purpose. It's because we have a part to play in the detoxifying process. 
You see, it's not God's job. It's not just his responsibility or his obligation even to do it for us. We can detox if I have a desire to do it. Well, this week we're going to look at some more of those if I's and what we can do to detoxify our spirits. But before we talk about that, we kind of got to understand what our spirit really is, right? And, and, and because there's a lot of confusion sometimes about spirit or spirit and soul, right? And, and are they different or are they the same thing? How do they work? And, and that's a great question. So I thought we would go to the Bible and we would see what it has to say. So let's start with spirit, okay? Well, we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it tells us very simply put, God makes it very clear to us, as he speaks with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he says, let us make man in our likeness and image. Let us make man in our likeness and image. And we find in John chapter 4, verse 24, this is also very straightforward. When we know the gospel is truth, it says this, first three words, God is what? God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Our spirit, church family, is the life force that God breathed into us and breathed into all of mankind. It is what gives us a likeness and image to the Father. It's not that God has a beard. It's not that he's got a bald head. It is a spiritual connection, a spiritual likeness. I like to picture my God with a goatee and a bald head, but it's not that he has that. It has nothing to do with physical attributes. It's a spiritual attribute. He puts his spirit into us. And it is different from the life that he gave animals, the life that he gave to plants, because they were not made in the likeness and the image of the Father. We are the only creation that was made that way. And we can confirm this life-giving aspect of the spirit in so many other areas of the Bible. We can look at Luke chapter 8. There's a story of, of this. Uh, he was uh, the leader of the synagogue. He was a Jewish leader. His name was Jairus. And we read about him in Luke chapter 8. He had a daughter who fell deathly ill. And even though he was part of the group that wanted to see Jesus dead, he still believed in Jesus and believed in his healing powers and his miracle giving and life giving abilities. And so Jairus goes to Jesus and he says, will you please come home with me? Which, you know, that was obviously not a good thing to do as a Jewish leader, but he says, he didn't care. He says, will you come home with me and will you come and, and pray with my daughter and heal my daughter? She's fallen deathly ill. And Jesus agrees and they start to head to Jairus' house and before they get there, the little girl dies. Well, Jesus says, hey, let me go up to the room and he still goes up to the room and, and he speaks to the girl and he commands the child to get up and it says in verse 55 of Luke chapter 8, it says this, and her what? Her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given to her to eat. It's like, come to life and better eat, right? <laughs> Who's with me on that one, right? That's time to eat, right? <laughs> oh, it's not time to eat yet if you're doing intermittent fasting, right? But, but he, he brings her to life with the spirit. And of course, we find another powerful example of the life attribute of the Spirit in Matthew chapter 27, verse, uh, verse 50, when we see Jesus take his final breath after he's been crucified on the cross. It says in 2750, it says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his what? His Spirit. When his Spirit left, his body lived no more. James 2.26 says, For as the body apart from the what? The spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. See, it's the spirit that brings life to the physical. And bottom line, it is still a phenomenon that science cannot and will not ever be able to explain or prove by anything other than supernatural means. Not going to happen. Another important aspect of the spirit is this that our spirit communicates and connects us to God. It communicates and connects us to God. In the book of Job, there's a young man named Elihu. 
His name's Elihu, and he's listening to Job, and, and three of Job's friends bicker back and forth about everything that's going on with Job, and, and, and you know, all the tragedy that's happened to Job. If you don't know the story, I want to encourage you to read it. Job loses everything, you know, and he has nothing, loses his family, loses all his wealth, loses his health, and they're just, him and his three friends are bickering back and forth, and this, this young guy named Elihu, he's listening to this, and he's getting frustrated, and he's like, oh my goodness. And finally, in chapter 38, it says that Elihu was just, he was chomping at the bit. He was burning with anger, it says, at both uh, Job as well as his three friends. And he finally speaks out. And this is what he says in Job 32, verses 6 through 10. He says, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore, I was timid, and I was afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let the days, or let the wisdom, let the elders speak, and many years teach wisdom. But it is the what? The spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. It is not the old who are wise, nor the age who understand what is right. Therefore I say, listen to me, and let me also declare my opinion. That is so powerful. That is good stuff right there, especially for us older folks, right, that think we can't learn anything from the younger generations. God speaks to all of us. doesn't matter our age. Amen? And Elihu's spirit right here, it says, he received the wisdom from God to deliver to Job and his friends a word. You see, we in turn, through our spirits, we can also hear from God. And I'll give you a few examples. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and have the urge to pray for someone or something? Yeah, it's not the pizza you ate the night before. It's the spirit. You ever get a feeling of discernment about a situation, just like something is different, something is not right, something is off about this situation or this person, right? You ever get that uneasiness or that conviction and you don't even know why? It's the spirit, you know, if you've ever heard someone pray in tongues, which, you know, sometimes that, like, oh, I don't know, that seems kind of weird. If you've ever heard that, or you've ever experienced it yourself, that is your spirit communicating with the Spirit of God directly in the most intimate way, in a language that we don't understand. It's like when computers speak in binary code. We can't read it. It's ones and zeros, right? It's the same way with the gifts of the Spirit when it comes to speaking in tongues. It's a heavenly language. It's a language when our spirits are talking to each other. And see, all of this is examples of God and the Holy Spirit speaking and communicating with your spirit. Now, there are so many more things that we could cover about the spirit that we don't have time to today. Um, we actually have a whole series coming up here the first quarter of this year that we're going to talk a lot more about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be teaching more about it. Um, so if you're curious or you've always had a, I wonder what all that is really all about, we're going to teach more about that coming up. So you don't want to miss that. Get excited about that. Um, but here's the, uh, the, a couple other things about our spirit, right? Is our spirit is also where our gifts flow from and where our gifts are contained within. Gifts like wisdom and knowledge and prophecy and healing and discernment and even like we talked about tongues. And I want to share this with you. There are many of you in this room today that you have gifts that you are already in possession of in your spirit that you haven't activated yet. They're there. It's almost kind of like your phone. I don't have mine on me. How many of you have ever been like on your phone and all of a sudden your kid does something and you're like, how did it do that? And you're like, oh, they're like, oh, it does it all the time. You're like, no way. I like, I was a total geek the other day. I figured out that my contour remote from my, my Cox cable box would actually control our home life. And so my kids were like just dying. But I'm like, lights on, lights off, like door unlock, door lock. And like my remote control for my TV is controlling the rest of my house. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Well, that, that, that ability had been there the whole time. I just didn't realize it. Once I realized it, I'm using the heck out of it, right? I'm upstairs. I'm like, I'm going to just turn off the lights downstairs. Lights off, right? And shush, they're going off. The kids are like, what's going on, right? I love it. It's awesome. But that's, that's the power of the Spirit. Well, that's a basic understanding. Now, as far as switching over, let's talk about our soul for a minute, okay? When God took the, the dirt, 
right? We've all read the story in, in Genesis chapter two. He took dirt, that's our body, that's the physical, and he breathed life into it. He breathed life into it. Well, the merger of those two became what is known as our soul. And our soul is comprised primarily, not just, but primarily of our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's really what makes each and every one of us unique. Now, theologically speaking, and this is just a little extra, this is like a little bonus tidbit for you to ponder on a little bit. There are two viewpoints when it comes uh, to regarding, when it comes to the the whole uh, body and spirit and soul. There's two trains of thought or two viewpoints and how they all connect together and, and what's eternal and what's not. There's what's called a dichotomy viewpoint, which basically, as you probably can gather by the name, it says that we live as a two-part existence, that we are body and we are spirit. We are material and immaterial beings. We are a two-part spirit, that the spirit, or a two-part being, that the spirit and the soul are connected, that they're unified, and that they live on eternally. And this is the viewpoint that is most widely accepted amongst theologians. But there is another viewpoint. It says that we are a trichotomy, that we are a three-part, that the body, the spirit, and the soul are three distinct and separate things. And at the time of death, the spirit is the only thing that's eternal. Now, biblically speaking, there is evidence that you could argue both views, okay? And we could go back and forth all day and dig into those. So as to which one is correct, I'm telling you right now, no one can be certain of. But we can be certain of this, is that the human nature itself is truly comprised of a body, a soul, and a spirit. And we read that all throughout scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says this. It says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, your pneuma, and your soul, your psyche, and your body, your soma, be kept blameless, which is the detoxified, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So ultimately here, church family, whether soul and spirit are united or they are somehow distinct, it's not an issue that God chose to make abundantly clear in his word. It may be one of those questions that when we finally stand before him face to face, that we'll finally get to ask him if we even care about it at that point in time, amen? We might be like, whoa, there's so many other cool things I gotta talk to. I don't even care about that dichotomy, trichotomy thing, right? I really wanna know who did this or that, right? (laughs) Y'all probably have a few questions you really wanna ask. Who's got some questions they wanna ask God when they finally get there? Right on. I do too. I got a list going. So, um, but, but that's, that's kind of an understanding of those two things. So, so how does our spirit, let's kind of move on and talk about how our spirit becomes toxic. Well, there is only one thing that our spirits can be toxed out by, one thing that our spirit is vulnerable to, and it is actually deadly. And it takes all kinds of forms. It takes on all kinds of forms, and it mutates to find its way in to infect our spirits. And that one thing is what we call sin. And you see, we see evidence of its deadly nature uh, to our spirits. We see it right in the beginning uh, of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, when God was speaking to Adam, this was before he even created Eve. He says in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he says, but you know that tree, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely, what? You'll die. See, God warned Adam. He warned him ahead of time before Eve got into the picture. So, so Adam should have known better, right? I mean, see, some of the stupid things, guys, that we'll do for the ladies in our lives, I mean, come on, right? He knew better. So he can't really blame Eve. He knew ahead of time. So ladies, you're off the hook. It wasn't your fault. It was Adam. He didn't listen, you know? I mean, to be willing to defy the creator of the heavens and the earth when he knew better. But the reality is that it clearly said that they will die. Well, obviously, if they would die, after they ate of the apple, physically they lived, didn't they? They lived for hundreds of years after that. Why? Because God wasn't talking about a physical. He was talking about a spiritual death. So the spiritual death in a biblical context is not ceasing to exist, but it is being eternally separated from God the Father. It's kind of like the mafia term, you're dead to me, right? Where was that from, right? 
I need to put gauze in my mouth before I do that. <laughs> right? But, or in modern day terms, for all my millennials in the house, it's like getting ghosted on social media, right? You know, that was the thing, is, is we are eternally, we are spiritually separated and dead from the Father. But I ask you, how in the world, how in the world could sin have crept in when our spirits were perfect? Well, that's where the soul comes in. Because you see, the soul acts, it acts as a valve or like a firewall from our bodies to our spirits and vice versa. That's how the soul operates. And the cool part is, is that God gave our souls the ability to exercise free will and the ability to have the gift of choice. And you see, when Adam and Eve, they ate of the apple, they exercised that free will, didn't they? And what did they do? They introduced a fatal toxin, not only into their lives, but into humanity, and has been passed down ever since through all of mankind. But I got some good news. Anybody want to hear some good news? And it is the good news. Are you sure you want to hear this good news? That's kind of lame, y'all. Do you want to hear some good news? All right. There is a way to detoxify our spirits. And it is the only way to detoxify our spirits. And not only is it a cure, but it is also a vaccination for our spirits. And here it is. And I want you to repeat this after me. Say, I can detox my spirit if I give my life to Jesus Christ. There it is. Plain and simple. Say it again. I can detox my spirit if I, here's a new one, unconditionally surrender to him. I can detoxify my spirit if I accept him as my Lord and Savior. See, because when we do that, you know what the Bible tells us? It tells us that God, he takes, he plucks out that old, nasty, stinky, rotten, festering, cesspool full of toxin spirit. He takes it, he plucks it right out of us, and he gives us a brand new one. He gives us a brand new one. Not my words, the Bible says it. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26, God says this to us. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new what? A new spirit I will put within you. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has what? It's passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, I know some of you are looking at that second passage right there, that second verse, and you're going, but Pastor John, it doesn't specifically say spirit. It just says we're a new creation. That could mean body, that could mean soul, that could mean all three. I don't think so. Because if that's what he was talking about, if he was talking about our souls, then immediately upon our conversion to Christ, any sinful behaviors or habits we had, anything that deals with our mind, our will, our emotions, would have been completely eradicated and we would be perfect. And from the best I can tell, just like me, not very many people in this room are perfect. How many of y'all would agree with me? Amen? And if y'all are perfect, I want to meet you and talk to you and figure out how you're doing it right now, right? And the other thing is, if he was talking about our bodies being new creations, then I'm pretty depressed because my new creation body doesn't grow hair out of its ears and look like this in the mirror. Y'all with me on that one? You're like, yeah, that's definitely not a new creation body either, right? You know, but, but turn to your neighbor right now and tell him, well, that explains a lot. Go ahead and tell him, that explains a lot. But if you just said that to your wife, look back at her husband and say, but I still think you're perfect. I still think you're perfect, right? Yeah, trying to help you guys out. Galatians 4, 6. We read further evidence that the new spirit is placed within us. It's actually the spirit of the son. It says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And Romans 8, 9 says, you, however, are not of the flesh, but in the what? In the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And church family, if you have truly given your life to Jesus Christ, there is only one way that you could ever toxify your spirit out again. And that would be to willfully, willfully uh, reject Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And that's what it says in Mark chapter three, verses 28 and 29. 
when it says this. <clears throat> it says, truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now I know some of you in this room today, that causes you some worry. That causes you some anxiety. That causes you some stress. You think to yourself, oh my goodness, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Am I saved? Have I, have I, have I received salvation? And I want to say this, and here's the deal with it. If you are worried about it, you probably haven't committed it. Because someone who is worried about it has the Holy Spirit living within them because they're convicted of it. Because people that don't care about Jesus and don't care about the Holy Spirit are the people that also don't care about that question right there. So you can rest assured and confident that if you said, Jesus, please enter my life, and you feel convicted that he is right there. Amen. Amen. You guys feeling all right? All right. So as we begin to wrap up here this morning, uh, we're going to start digging in uh, through the rest of the series here on this whole soul component because we know obviously like our bodies, our souls have the ability to carry toxins. And when our souls are toxed out, not only do they affect our soul, they mess with the connection from our spirits to our bodies. They can also mess with the connection of our spirit to God. And you may be wondering, well, do I need a soul tox? Do I have toxins in my soul? And let me just share with you a few things that you can ask yourself to see if you need some soul detox, okay? Number one, do you find yourself scrolling through social media, seeking negativity or looking to find some pleasure in other people's misfortune? You know, because misery loves company, right? You might need some soul detox. Do you have a tendency to spew sarcasm unintentionally when you speak? I'm like, my son needs some serious soul detoxing right now. But you spew it even when you try to be more mindful. You just can't seem to help yourself. Do your friends not really want to be around you? Or do you not really want to be around your friends? Does your heart just ache? Or even worse, does it feel nothing at all? Is it just numb? Do happy people, do happy people tick you off? I mean, do you want to just punch them in the jaw when they start talking about feeling more joyful? Do you not sleep well? Are you maybe having nightmares or bad dreams? Do you keep finding yourself in circumstances where you constantly feel like you're the victim? Do you shy away from prayer or meditation or even anything inspirational at all? Are you not motivated to read your Bible? Do you feel bored? Sometimes, all the time? Do you lack energy or motivation to really get up and do much of anything? And can you even remember, can you even remember a time when you took a walk or when you stopped to appreciate the beauty that God's placed all around us? To walk barefoot in the grass, to stare at a sunrise or a sunset. And the last one, do you give in to temptations rather quickly and easily just looking for some temporary relief from reality? And then do you justify your behaviors afterwards? How many of you can relate to one or more of those maybe that I just talked about? I know I can. I know I can. And if that's the case, then you definitely could use a little soul detoxing just like me. And I'm just going to tell you this. I am so excited. I'm so excited to see what kind of untapped potential that we have as we detoxify our body, our spirits, and our souls. And we detoxify our nature. Because I truly believe that we will see, not can see, but we will see manifestations of the Spirit that we have never dreamed we would ever get to see. And we will see it right here and we will see it in our lives. I believe we will see miracles. I believe we will see healings. I believe we will receive prophetic words. I believe we will receive blessings and abundance beyond all of our imagination. I believe it. And I know because God promises it. And the best part of it all 
is we will feel a whole new closeness to our Savior right here, right now. Because God says, I will walk with them and they will be my sons and daughters. I want you to say this with me. I can learn to detox my soul if I come back next week. Uh, you all were thinking there was going to be something real deep and emotional there, right? <laughs> Will you pray with me? God, we just love you. God, we are so enamored by you. And we are so honored to be in your presence, God. And we are so excited for the promise that if we are just willing to continue to, to work on cleansing ourselves, detoxifying all the junk in our lives, all the stuff that clouds our, our, our ability to hear from you and our ability to go out and do your work, God, that if we're willing to work on that, God, you don't tell us that we have to do it all. You'll meet us there. But God, if we start the process, it says that you will purify us, that you will sanctify us, that you will make us holy and set apart. And God, I know that each and every person in this room, I know deep down in that spirit that they desire that, God. And I just ask for you to help each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room today that has never made that decision, that has never said, if I give my life to you, Jesus, will you be with me? God, I pray that today would be the day. And if you've never made that decision, I want you to raise your hand right now. And I want you to just say this in your heart right now. Say, God, today I give my life to your son, Jesus Christ. I know that he died on the cross for my sins. I know that you raised him from the dead and he is now seated at your right hand. And I know one day he will come back again in glory. And God, your word promises that you will forever be with me, that you will seal my spirit. So today I ask for that. I know my soul's not perfect and I know my body needs work, but God, help me. And I will chase you with everything that I have and I will lay everything that I have down at your feet. And Lord, I pray that if there's some of us in this room today that, that maybe we've walked away or maybe we've been struggling with our relationship with you, God, today I pray would be the day that we would detoxify and we would recommit our lives to you that we would lay our spirits back down at the foot of the cross, God, that we would say, please, God, bring us back into that closeness. And Lord, we are excited to see what works you have in store for this church, this community, and this world. God, help us finish stronger than we started. And we ask all these things in your son's mighty and precious name. And everyone said, amen.